It is April 6th of 1945, and as the battle for Okinawa rages, a group of F6F Hellcats roar over the Pacific, providing key support for forces on the ground and pounding Japanese airfields to protect their own fleet. But suddenly, on one of these missions, unexpected visitors arrive, and without time to think, Don McPherson pushes the stick over and starts the first dogfight of his career in writing a crucial page in the story of a future ace. Let's hear the story, dive into the records, and relive the mission. After just taking part in his first real mission on March 19th, Don has now officially seen combat in the Pacific and was nearly a foot away from becoming a casualty. But he survived, and now the fighting was only going to get more intense. As we can see in his logbook, after his first mission, Don flies patrol, protecting the crippled USS Franklin, and then, on March 21st, flies a message drop mission. And here, after doing some digging, we can find color film of the USS Essex launching and recovering aircraft on this exact date. March 21st of 1945. I have not been able to specifically see any of the ID numbers on the side of the Hellcats, but somewhere in one of these fighters is the young Don McPherson. Following this, on March 23rd, the real fight would begin. Here we can see that the next few missions centered around one target, Okinawa. On these sorties, Fighter Squadron 83 pounded the airfields and bombarded targets throughout the island hoping to clear the way for the troops that were coming to land soon. With Okinawa in our hands, we could control the China coast, send swarms of planes to smother Japan. We were reaching for the throat of an empire. The risk must be taken. We started in really concentrating on Okinawa, you know, trying to get things softened up there, you know, for the actual invasion of Okinawa. We worked on a lot of their airfields and, of course, a lot of their installation and military installations and our uh, search uh, camera people even found a uh, a sub base. It's uh, where they they made uh, one man submarines. So they could use them as kamikaze, a little submarine with one guy in it, and if they got the chance to drive it into a, a ship, you know, and it explode. And so we found that base, and, and we destroyed it at one point. As these attacks went on, Don McPherson and the rest of the aircraft from the Fast Carrier Task Force pounded Okinawa in preparation. And then, on April 1st, they were given a new loadout for a different kind of attack, napalm. This meant that today, something was happening, the invasion. Men of the Navy, 400,000 men, called it Love Day. Elsewhere in the world, it was Easter Sunday, 1945. At 8.30 that morning, the Marines and the Army went in. The first seven days were battling, mysteriously quiet. Ashore, Army and Marines pushed steadily forward, looking for an enemy which had vanished. On the 1,400 ships supporting the invasion, men waited at their battle stations and waited. We knew the blow would come, but how and when? On April the 1st, which turned out to be Easter Sunday, early that morning, why the invasion forces was off the coast of, of Okinawa, and it was amazing the number of ships that they had bombarding the coast. They had battleship shooting, uh, uh, the cruisers were lobbing shells in there. With, they had w one uh, a uh, rocket launcher setting off there, shooting rockets in there. On the island of Okinawa, 5,000 miles from San Francisco, the earth shook from a fearful pounding by our ships and planes. 
There's a Jap carrier in trouble. We were carrying napalm bombs that morning, which is a fire bomb, and we went in and scorched the beach ahead of the landing barges. You know, we could see the landing barges starting to come in when we dropped it. And, and it really turned out, I guess, as good as you'd ever expect as far as the landing was concerned, because the Japanese had either guessed right or else they had gotten some information as to when the invasion was going to happen. and. They had pulled back from the beach a lot of their forces into the mountainous areas of Okinawa. There was another thing that we did then to help out uh, in Okinawa. We would report over there and they would have a uh, Air Force guy flying a small airplane, flying real low around the area. And he would have targets for us. We'd get on the same frequency in the radio with him. And one time I, we reported in and said, what do you got for us today? And he says, I got an old grass hut here I don't like the looks of. He says, put a little ammo into that. Well, we strafed it. It was an ammunition dump. And boy, talk about 4th of July. That was quite an explosion. And then another time he had a haystack that he, he, he said, put a rocket into that. Well, that was a a fuel dump, so black smoke was rolling, you know. So those those were kind of fun because you didn't have anybody shooting at you, you know, when you're doing it. <clears throat> For the close support, you know, why not only they could be shooting at you, but the bit of so dangerous because you'd come over one peak you know, in the mountainous area and shoot your rockets and then pull up so that you didn't crash into the next one, you know. So, so those, those are pretty tough. But despite the quiet on the beachheads, miles away, the forces of Imperial Japan were putting together a massive response to the American invasion force. This response would be spearheaded by the Divine Wind, or Kamikaze. Then it struck. They call it kamikaze, meaning the divine tempest. We call them suicide planes, manned by pilots wearing the ceremonial red sash of the kamikaze corps. They specialize in one-way trips. Their destination, the deck or hull of any American ship under which plane, bombs, burning gasoline, and red sashed pilot can crash. At that period of time, that had been in, in the second half of March. And the second half of March into April, uh, the Kamikaze Corps was just harassing the fleet like crazy. Our gunners on the ship almost ate and slept at their gun mounts because there was a bogey on the screen, you know, seemed like a thing all the time, mostly. As the kamikaze attacks began to get more fierce, the invasion of Okinawa officially began. 
Just a few days after this, the Japanese Navy launched their last true offensive of the war, Operation Tengo. This would be an attempt to drive out the Allied forces from Okinawa, using the kamikaze as their primary weapon. To hopefully put a stop to this, the USS Essex sent Don McPherson and Wonder 5 on an attack mission to strike one of the airfields facilitating these attacks. With Wonder 5, uh, then they decided this little island of Kikishima as an airfield that they felt like possibly some of those suiciders who were stationed at that were harassing the fleet. And so they sent the four of us over there with the rockets to tear that place up. Well, when we got over there, there were no air, airborne aircraft, so we started. There weren't very many on the ground either. They Apparently they were all up, you know, trying to do their thing. And and so we really worked on their hangars and, and their buildings and stuff, and we even got a few rockets into their landing strip to make it tough, you know, for them to use that and stuff. And then we were, decided we'd better get back because we're getting low on ammo and stuff. So we started back to the Essex and we just got started and we probably weren't over maybe 1,800 feet off the ocean and a flying wing on Carlos. And all of a sudden I spotted these two dive bombers coming at us on a converging course. Only they were real low on the water, and so so I had to dive in order to, you know, get on one of them, and, and uh, all I had, it's a good thing I had not put my guns back on safety because I wouldn't have had time to get a shot off. I, I shoved the nose over and put my sight on the path of that Valdez bomber, the first one, and, and I shot him and I saw the pilot slump forward and he plunged into the ocean. Just like that, Don McPherson has scored his first aerial kill. He spotted a pair of Val dive bombers just above the surface of the ocean, headed right towards them and attempting to make it back home. He quickly responded and pushed the stick down, barely getting the nose down in time to fire. Here, Don sees the cockpit of the Val take a hit, likely striking the pilot and then the aircraft plunged into the water. But there's no time to dwell on this victory. Well, then I wondered what happened to the second one. I wondered whether the other guys had jumped onto him. But I did a wing over and, and I saw that it was flying to this airfield we had just damaged. And so I gave the old Hellcat full throttle and, and they started catching up with it. And I was just ready to, to press the trigger to shoot and I heard my division leader hollering at me with the radio, he said, Don, get out of there, they're, they're shooting at you from the anti-aircraft, the shore batteries. And uh, But I continued to squeeze the trigger and that one exploded, and so then I made a wing over and some real maneuvering, you know, to keep from getting shot down to get out of there. Still coming at the airfield was the second valve. With none of his friendly Hellcats around him, Don turned and followed after it, but then gets a call over the radio from his leader, warning him that the Japanese anti-aircraft batteries are beginning to open up. Don, however, wasn't going to let this one get away. He gets into a firing position as quickly as possible and pulls the trigger, and this time lights the bandit aflame, sending it following downwards near the coast of the island. Tally two kills for Don McPherson. After doing some maneuvering to avoid ground fire, he turned back and locates the rest of Wander 5. Well then I was wondering what the, the other three guys had been doing all this time. Well, come to find out there had been two more vile dive bombers tra trailing those two that I saw, that I shot down. And so the division leader shot down one of those and the section leader got the other. Then tail end Charlie, he he found a lily, and I guess they're doing research afterwards. I guess that was a twin engine search plane of some sort. And so each one of us got our first kill that day. During this time, Wander 5 had been putting in their own work, with every member of the flight scoring a kill. It had been a great day for not only Fighter Squadron 83, but also for the rest of the Fast Carrier Task Force supporting Oganawa. 
Scores of Japanese planes had been downed, including 69 kills for Fighter Squadron 83 alone, with little loss of American life in return. But the Japanese would not give up here. There were more waves of kamikaze aircraft coming in the next few days, and it would still be up to Dawn and Wonder 5 to take off again and defend the fleet. And what a fight he would be in for. All of this will be coming in Part 3 of Dawn's story, coming soon to TJ3 History. If you want behind-the-scenes content and to support my work, check out my Patreon at the link below, or sign up for my free World War II History newsletter. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.